Hi guys, Dr. Andre Pinesett, the study doc here, and I'm answering another one of your questions as part of the Ask Dr. Pinesett segment. Thank you to everyone who's been leaving voicemails. I'm loving it because it's giving me an opportunity to teach directly to you guys. And today I'm answering Macy's question and we're talking all about pre-med research. What are the best opportunities? How to find opportunities? We're gonna dive right into it, guys. So let's hit the intro and let's get right to Macy's question. All right, guys, like I said, I'm Dr. Andrew Pinesett, the study doc, and as always, I'm here to help you guys be more positive, be more productive, and reach your goals. That's whether you're a student or pre-med, whatever you're doing academically, I can help you. And I do Ask Dr. Pinesett, where you guys can go to my website, thestudydoc.com, leave me a voicemail, and I will reply back to you and teach directly to you on these segments. And today, I'm teaching to Macy. So let's get to Macy's voicemail, and then we'll answer her question, guys. Let's get to it right here. Hi, Dr. Pinesett. My name is Macy Mambold. I'm from New York. I actually just recently signed up for your uh, TST program. Oh, in my study program. I love I it. If you guys are not my study program, it's incredible. I was wondering, um, what are the best options for research? And how do you go about getting it? And Really, the main question is, do you do research with your students? <laughs> I like the plug right there to get in research with me. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Macy, for your question. Uh, if you guys heard her correctly, she's in my five pillars. She's in my studying program. And my study program is for students who want to become more efficient, more independent as students. And then I also have my Dominate Pre-Med coaching program, which is my pre-med side. And so the first thing I want to say to Macy is, hey, you're halfway there. Get to my Dominate Pre-Med program. It's super affordable, $20 a month. But check that program out, Macy, first of all. But let's get to your question today, which regards research. We're gonna address each one of these questions individually. So the first one is, hey, Dr. Pinesett, what is the best pre-med research I can get involved with? And this is a tricky question because what is the best research project will vary for each one of us. We first, before we can understand what, how to evaluate something or evaluate an opportunity or how to make a decision on it, we have to understand the function, the purpose that something serves, right? And in this case, we're looking at research. Well, what is the function of research? Why do we do research? What are we trying to accomplish? And we're trying to get to medical school. So what role does research serve in that process? What I teach my students in my dominant pre-med coaching program is that there are six domains of pre-med excellence, right? Boxes you have to check, if you will, right? And one of those domains is scholarly potential, where you show medical school Schools, you are a gentleman and a scholar and that you can enrich their academic environment. That's the bottom line. So what we're trying to do when we do scholarly things is we're trying to show medical schools that, hey, listen, I can contribute to enriching, to making better, to rounding out, to enhancing the academic environment, the environment we're learning in at your university. I'm going to contribute to that environment positively. Okay, that's what they're looking for. And the way medical schools evaluate you across all domains and across all aspects of your application is they're looking at all your experiences or activities and they're trying to pull out traits and characteristics so they can project how great you will be as a medical student and as a future physician. In the scholarly potential domain, what medical schools are looking for, like I said, to contribute to that scholarly environment, the key traits they're looking for are as follows. And I wrote them down so I can give you guys the complete list here, okay? The first thing that they're looking for, guys, is that they're looking for students who are professional. And professionals and professionalism, guys, always lead with professionalism. If you're not a professional, if you're not buttoned up, man, people are concerned about having you around because you might end up one way, the other way, any kind of way. They want to be represented well, not embarrassed. Be professional. The second thing they're looking for is teamwork. So are you a team player? Were you able to contribute to a research lab functionally and be part of that team and be someone that people wanted to have around? Are you a curious person? Were you inquisitive? Did you have questions? Did you then, right, go and discover, right? The ability to discover and find answers to those questions is the next jump that we're making in research, right? Using our scientific method to solve the questions we have about the world. And then in addition to discovering things, we wanna be creating. We look at one of the six domains, right? The scholarly potential. Another one of those domains is academic aptitude, which is showing medical schools that we can hang academically in their university, that we won't flunk out. And so in that realm, we're looking at our ability to be able to absorb knowledge, absorb material. In the scholarly potential domain, it's the other side of it. We're looking for people, we're looking for characteristics of people who can generate, who can create that knowledge, right? The science that goes into making our textbooks, the science that goes into making our clinical decision trees. So this is about creation. So when you're involved in your research, are you creating something new? Are you discovering something? Innovation, 
changing the way we do things? Are you making an impact in the literature in a way that's significant and meaningful for our clinical treatment? Are you innovating medicine? We wanna see that, okay? Dissemination. So can you get the knowledge you created, the knowledge you discovered, can you get what you have learned? Can you disseminate it and get it out there by publishing, by talking, and so forth? So the dissemination of that knowledge is key. And then lastly, they want to see the impact, guys. So overall, with everything you guys do, medical schools want difference makers. Are you a difference maker? Are you a person who makes an impact? How have you impacted the research lab positively? That's what they're looking for, guys. So all those characters, let me run them again. They are professionalism, teamwork, curiosity, discovery, creation, innovation, dissemination, and impact. All of those characteristics are what they're looking for. Now, we understand that now, so that's what we're trying to evidence to them. So how do we evidence it? And this is where a lot of people go wrong in research, is they like, yes, they're so excited, right? Cause it's so hard to get in a research lab. They're so excited to get into a research lab that they stop right there. I'm in here, I'm doing it. But no, we have to be purpose driven right? We can't get to a goal and we can't get to a goal efficiently unless we are clear on what that goal is, what that objective is. For research, there are two primary objectives that you must have. There are a bunch of secondaries which we'll also talk about, but there are two primary objectives, okay? Are you still with me? Let me reset this video for you. I am Dr. Andre Pinton. I am the study doc. I am answering one of your questions. This question comes from Macy. She actually asked me three questions. The first question, which is what we're addressing right now, is what is the best pre-med research? And we're getting into that, right? We have to understand the roots of that. The next question I will answer after this one is, what is the best way to get pre-med research? And the third question is, do I do research? Can she work with me? Okay, so now as we continue, we've laid out these characteristics, so now we have these couple goals that we're gonna have, two primary and a couple secondary. The two primary goals, if you're involved in research, write this down, guys. Pause the video for a second, get a pen, and write this down. These are the two things you must do to say that a research project was successful, okay? The first thing is, is you must get a stellar, a strong, a standout letter of recommendation from the lab's PI. Notice I said PI. I know a lot of people are like, oh, get it from the lab assistant, whatever. Yeah, that's cool, but it's not nearly as impactful as a letter from the PI, the person whose name's on the letterhead, right? That's what medical schools wanna see. And we want a strong, glowing, personalized letter of recommendation that speaks directly to who you are, the characteristics that medical schools wanna see, and to the difference maker you were in the lab. That's what we're trying to accomplish. That's the first goal. So if you get involved in a research project and you're looking at your options, ask yourself, wait a minute, how is this PI? Is this PI someone I can get along with? Someone I think I can form a positive impression with? Is this someone who's gonna be available? Is this someone who knows what the process is for writing, writing letter recommendations? If there's not that available to you, then that's not a great opportunity because the letter of recommendation is crucial, okay? The second goal that we have in research to make it a successful project is we have to have some sort of output or publication. And I don't use the word publication, I say output, because when we think publication, we think journal article. But there are numerous ways that we can have an output a research output. We can have the publication. We can have an abstract. We can do presentations about our research. We can do posters about our research. So there are numerous ways that we can have an output from a research experience, not just you know the standard, right? Put an article into a journal, okay? So we have two goals. One is letter recognition and two is the output. And the reason we need these two ingredients and why these are our two primary goals is simple, guys. I want you to think about like CSI. I like to watch SVU. Do you guys watch SVU? Special Victims Unit, Law and Order? Come on now, right? Where, where are my, my Dick Wolf fans at, right? Law and Order SVU, okay. Medical schools are like detectives. They're like the judge. And so you have to prove to them your case. You have to argue your case that you're an exceptional pre-man, you're gonna be an exceptional physician. And the way you do this is twofold. One is with the output. That output, guys, is evidence. It's the evidence of your greatness. It's the evidence of your characteristics, right? It's like finding a bloody glove or finding whatever. It's the evidence that you were there and you made an impact. That's cool, that's great. But all those things are just random objects. What puts the oomph on it and seals the case is an eyewitness. And that eyewitness who can testify to your greatness is that PI, is that letter of recommendation. So we have our evidence and our output, and then we have our eyewitness who can speak directly to how all these pieces come together to show how amazing you are, that's the letter of recommendation. So by getting those two things, we complete a full picture and a narrative for medical schools that allows them to say, oh snap, this person is scholarly. They are curious. They are someone who generated something. They are a discoverer. They 
they are impactful. They are all the characters we talked about before. This is how you complete the picture for them. Does that make sense, everybody? So those are our two primary objectives. So you want to look for a lab that is prolific in putting out papers. Do they have posters all the time? Do they have papers all the time? It's a well-known researcher. If it's a lab that never publishes, or they're not planning on publishing it for five years, that's not somewhere where you want to be because you're not going to have the output, the evidence you need. So you want to look for opportunities that allow you to say, listen, does this lead to a publication? Maybe not from day one, y'all, because come on, you're undergrad, you don't know what you're doing in research. But eventually, is there the opportunity to put out work? Is there an opportunity to get your name on something that's significant? That's important. And for a lot of times when you're evaluating these opportunities, some PIs are not great at supporting undergrads in getting publications. So it's a little key tip. A very important question to ask of a research opportunity in a PI is, hey, listen, you go and you, and you say it nonchalantly, right? Because you don't add anything to the lab. And you say, hey, listen, I know I'm just an undergrad researcher. I don't really know a whole lot. And so because I know I don't know a whole lot, but one of my goals is to be able to produce a work, a publication, a poster, something. Do you have experience in the past working with undergraduates and getting their names on outputs, getting them opportunities to show their work. If their answer is no, that's not a lab you wanna be in because they're not equipped to put you in a position to succeed. So they're not gonna be able to help you with one of your primary goals, so you don't wanna be there. So Macy, does that make sense to you? We'll look at those two primary objectives, and I'm not gonna belabor the point by getting all the secondary reasons. I go in detail in those, I won't talk about all those. But one of the big things I will say on the secondary side, one of the bigger uh, goals, is that when you're in a research lab, you want to get familiar with reading scientific literature. A, for the MCAT, but B, also for your life because you're gonna be a physician or a physician in training and you're gonna to have to decipher literature and see, okay, wait, is this significant? Does this matter? Does this change my clinical practice? You're gonna to have to evaluate things critically. You wanna be in a lab that has a very good support structure for lab meetings, for journal clubs, for those sort of things so you can be that scholar in the literature, be very facile and familiar with going through literature, okay? And like I said, I go into a lot more detail how to be successful in a research lab, how to make that strong impact with your professor, how to get letters of recommendation, how to get published, how to get published in 30 days and so forth in creative ways to get yourself out there in my dominant pre-med coaching program. I know I mentioned it earlier, but I want to encourage all of you guys, just check it out. Guys, there's a link in the box below. It's only $29 a month for you to get all my pre-med courses, to get coaching with me and to have your pathway laid out to medical school. So check that out in the box below. All right, that's just question one. If you guys are liking this video right now, give me that thumbs up. Click this video, like this video right now. If you listen on the podcast, take a second and say, dang, Dr. Pines is dropping his knowledge and leave me a review, okay? Let's get to Macy's second question. Macy's second question, which is, how do you get pre-med research positions? Is everybody still with me? Am I, are we going too long? Can, can you guys hang with me here? How do you go obtain pre-med research positions. This is so hard, guys. And like I said, people get excited to get into one because it's so hard to get one. And a lot of students get frustrated with the process. So I first wanna say, guys, getting a research position is hard. It's even more difficult now in a post or intermittent, whatever we are right now with COVID. I don't know really what you wanna call it, but in a COVID world, a post-COVID uh, pandemic, there's a lot more restrictions. People are a lot tighter about who they let hang around and be around and so forth. There's a lot of policies. And so getting research is harder than it used to be. Okay? A lot of the funding mechanisms dried up as, as the economics of academia kind of got shifted and so forth. So it's harder now to find research opportunities. Don't get frustrated. You will find one, stay persistent. There are a couple ways you can find a research opportunity. Option B, and I even though it's option B, I'm listing it first because this is what most people do, is email. They send out a bunch of emails to a bunch of PIs saying, hey, I'm gonna be a research lab, let me in. And I say that's option B because it's not the best option, which I'll talk about in a second, but with option B with emailing, a lot of students do it wrong. So I'm gonna lay out three key things you have to understand about cold emailing to get a research position. One, don't expect for your first email to result in a research experience. These people are big dogs. These people are busy. You are a tiny little tadpole to them. You have nothing to add, very little or nothing to add to their research lab. So if they let you in their lab, they're helping you out. They're giving up their time, of their resources, of their lab space to help you out. So understand that going in. You are not doing them a favor. They're doing you a favor. So as you email, you're going to have to send a lot of different emails to get a position. The key thing here though, where students mess this up, is either they just send one or two or three and they're like, oh, I'm never gonna reach a position, they give up. Don't do that. It takes more than that sometimes. But the second way students mess up is they mass blanket generic emails to everyone they can find. That's terrible, guys. When the PIs read these emails, they know they're generic. They know you didn't mention their research specifically. They know you didn't have specific reasons why you targeted them, and so they're not gonna be so apt to respond to you in the affirmative and let you into their lab because you haven't done the due diligence to show them that you really care about their lab. What you've shown them is that you care about getting an A lab, 
but it's not personal for them. So don't blanket all the labs. Plus a lot of these people talk, they have departmental meetings and so forth. You don't wanna be that guy who sent 100 emails out. So instead, what I teach my students to do is to send their emails out in batches. Send out five emails to five different labs. Wait, if you get rejected from a couple of those, okay, then add some more labs to your list. And then down from that way, and that way you're not inundating everybody at once, you have tiers of priority, and you can take the time to personalize those emails for each of those labs, okay? Additionally, I said, these people are doing you a favor by letting you in. So a lot of students make the mistake of just emailing once. Come on now. Guys, do you understand? My inbox right now, my email inbox, I think I have like 270 unread emails from this week. I get emails all day, every which way from all kinds of students. Sometimes I miss an email. <laughs> Sometimes I see an email, I'm like, I'll get to it later. I don't ever get back to it. Researchers are busy. They're doing you a favor. It's okay to follow up. And so what I teach my students to do is I give them actually templates for a follow-up email sequence. So they're gonna send these PIs multiple emails in a, in a discrete pattern of time to allow them to get the maximum opportunity that someone saw their email, was able to hear their message, and was able to respond in the affirmative. We wanna give them every opportunity to accept our proposition. So that's what I teach my students and I template it out. But for all of you guys, send more than one email. It's important, okay? There we go with the email. That's the first checkbox. The second thing is, and I think this is option A. So I gave you option B. Option A, the better way to get research. You guys still with me? Like this video right now. Let me know if you're with me. It's your first time with me. Subscribe, turn on live notifications. I'm always here. I am Dr. Pinesett. I am the study doc. And the second option or the, the primary option that I think is actually better than emailing is to plan out your career. Guys, you're a pre-med. You know what you have to do to get there. If you don't, get my nominate pre-med coaching program so you have an outline of what you need to do. It takes time to do all these things. So you need to be proactive and plan out and map out the things you wanna do because it takes time to do each of these things. And so one of the things you can do if you know you're gonna need research is start way out in advance preparing yourself to get that opportunity, start planting the seeds. And so what I say option A is for getting a research opportunity is actually networking. There are many ways you can network. You can network with your lecturers, your professors, so forth. You're with your TAs and ask them who they're working with and, and all kinds of things. There are a lot of times they're grad students who are doing research as part of their, their masters. You can network at departmental meetings. So every department has a monthly meeting, they have socials, they have mixers, so forth. Figure out when those are, show up at those and network effectively. Conferences, symposiums of the like, show up to those things, talk to them in their mode right? It's much more organic. It's much more natural when you're talking to someone face to face, when you can show them you're not a serial killer, when you can show them that you're curious, when you took the initiative to show up at something that most undergrads don't go to. And now you're talking to them just as a human being, not an intrusive email. It's just, hey, hey I'm here. You're here. Let's talk about me getting your research lab. <laughs> Bam. That face to face is a much clearer path to getting the research position you want. Okay. So I would say network, network heavily. I again, teach my students how to do that in detail, but that's how you obtain positions. You email and you're consistent, right? And you're persistent. You network, right? Form those connections and you use that way to get in there. Those are the ways that you can go ahead and get research. All right. So that's Macy. That's your second question. And then Macy, do your third question. Hey, Dr. Price, do you do research? And can I work with you? Macy, I'd love to have you work with me but I don't do research. <laughs> I do not do research, guys. As you guys know, I was on faculty at UCSD teaching their residents and medical school students all about anesthesia, but even then, I didn't do research, guys, and I've never been a lover of research. As a pre-med, I did it. I checked those boxes, got a letter of recommendation, got my outputs, but I didn't really love it, and I even told medical that I didn't love research. It's not my area, but I said to them, my area and what I'm passionate about is mentoring students, is teaching students, is being an educator. And I had many experiences doing that and building up that resume. And then when I got into medical school, I did the same thing. I started teaching, did MCAT outreach, did all these different things, right, during medical school. And then when I was in residency, I was doing the same thing, doing outreach. And then post-residency, I was doing resident education, medical education, doing grand rounds of the like. And then now that I'm not on faculty and I'm just in a private practice anesthesiologist and I'm just working with my students, I continue to work with students every day. I spend more time working with students than I do working as an anesthesiologist. So I had a passion, I identified it, and I followed it. And that's one of the key things for pre-med, guys, you gotta follow your passion. So Macy, I do not do research opportunities, but again, I'm passionate about helping students, right? So I do provide clinical experience for my students. I allow my students to come shout on me, to get those hours, to get a physician letter recommendation. I have two of my students currently right now who work with me as anesthesia assistants who assist me in direct paid clinical experience. Because that's me, again, putting money in their pocket. That's me giving them clinical experience. And again, giving them that mentorship to move them along the process. So I do things that I'm passionate about. So no, Macy, you cannot work with me in research, but if you reach out to me, you can reach work with me clinically, uh, potentially. All right, so I hope this video has helped you guys 
And I want you guys, again, take a second and comment and say thank you, Macy, for asking these questions to get us these answers because we all have these same questions because I get them all the time, right? You have these questions, so thank Macy uh, right now in the comment box. And if you are a student or you are a pre-med and you have questions that you want answers, you want expert answers to, take a second, get to my website, thestudydoc.com, click on that little tab that says Ask Dr. Pineset a Question. Click on the little tab that says leave Dr. Pineset a voicemail and leave me a voicemail so I can answer your question, guys. If you want everything, you want all my pre-med expertise, get to my website also and get into my dominant pre-med coaching program. Like I said, it's only $29 a month. It's super affordable because I know what it is, right? What your guys' budgets are like. And so I wanted to provide the highest quality of expertise and advice and coaching for you guys to get to medical school, but at a price that almost any student could afford. So check that out on my website, guys. I thank you for joining me. How do we end every single video? No excuses, just dominate, guys. Take a second, like this video, subscribe if you are new. Comment in the box below, what was your biggest takeaway from this video? What was your biggest takeaway? And how are you gonna apply that to get ahead in your pre-med career, guys? Until then, guys, get to work. I'll see you next time. Dr. Pintet, I'm out. That's it for another episode of the Study Doc Show. Show your love by smashing the like button and commenting in the box below. Today is the day, guys. No more excuses, no more complaining. You're going to take your future into your own hands. You're going to dominate. You're going to be successful. I challenge you. What are you going to do today to make your life better? Get to my website, thestudydoc.com. Grab a free ebook, sign up for a free webinar. And if you're really ready to transform, enroll in one of my life changing courses or coaching programs. You have greatness inside you. Let me show you how to unlock it so you can dominate and make your dreams a reality. No excuses, just dominate.